Hello everyone, welcome to Somewhere in Between. We're students from Leuphana University and we took the train from Hamburg to Lüneburg. In the next 30 minutes, you're gonna see what we found along our way. I'm Ege. Hi, I'm Karina. Hi, I'm Henry. Hi, I'm Isabella. And somewhere between Hamburg and Lüneburg, we land in Asshausen. And one of the citizens there is an artist whose work was already shown in Shanghai. We visited Sonja Schumacher and took a closer look at her work. During the train ride from Hamburg to Lüneburg, the metronome stops in the small village of Ashausen. 3,800 people call this village their home. One of them is Sonja Schumacher. As an artist, painting was her medium of choice in order to express herself. The trained physiotherapist is 60 years old and dedicated the last 20 years of her life to art. In her studio, she creates artwork of various sizes and shapes using acrylic paint and clay. Her paintings explore the human condition and try to reveal the emotions hidden inside. The central motives are often head and eyes. For me, the eyes are windows to our soul. We speak with our eyes and can express a lot with them. That's why it's very interesting and appealing to me to dive into the human being through the eyes. Living with Sonja, her husband, Dr. Detlef Schumacher, experiences her working process vividly. When she works, she works extremely intensively. She kneels on the floor, she works on the images with whatever is at hand, and that can take time. Social issues such as war, refugees, misery and fear are some of the topics Sonja Schumacher addresses in her art. I don't want to criticize, that's not what I'm about. I paint because I have to, because I have questions about the way we treat each other. That's important for me. Sonja is a person of extremes. That means she can be a life-affirming, cheerful person, but she can also immerse herself in very deep thoughts. Sonja Schumacher strives to unmask people, to look behind the facade. Her art is not about aesthetics or beauty. She describes it as painting in between skin and soul, expressing the invisible, the unspeakable and the finitude. But as an artist, she has to face some challenges. Als Künstler gesehen zu werden. To be seen as an artist, that is actually the greatest difficulty. You work for decades, sometimes a whole life. And since less and less money is being spent on culture lately, it's becoming more and more difficult to find exhibition venues. Therefore, she's even more excited to get the opportunity to exhibit her work this summer. The theme is going to be Shadows, inspired by Freud's psychoanalysis. Interested people can visit the exhibition from August to September 2023 in Uelzen and Lüneburg. And in addition to the exhibition, Sonja Schumacher is actually happy to welcome guests at her home, at her gallery, to show them around and show them her artwork. And more info about information about her and her art pieces and coming up galleries can be found on her website. Definitely a nice idea for a day trip. I think it's always great when you live in a bigger city to just get out of it and discover the smaller villages you have in between, go to the nature or have a look at art pieces. I think this is just an amazing opportunity. Yeah. Um, I really like the experience in small cities and like um, I always see the same bus driver every <laughs> day and or like once two two days it's like really awesome experience they ask me like where i come from but uh, we have language barrier but sometimes we use sign language and yeah we can still talk so um i know this guy's name is called uh Wilson or something yeah and he's a really nice guy so i really really like the vibe of um like knowing all the people in the small town yeah yeah well it seems like you really like the comfort 
of a small town. And even though I come from a big city, uh, where my uni is in my hometown, is really a closeted area. So in there, I also have the comfort of living in a small town, like not a small town, but just a closeted area. And like knowing each face and like being able to make small talks along your way is really a comfort comforting feeling. And I think like that is something to appreciate more because that comfort, like even though you're alone, you're going through a stressful time, that comfort really makes you feel good. And that's one of the things I miss the most. So what about you guys? I think we all grew up in big cities. I grew up in Hamburg, so moving to Lüneburg was a big step for me, actually, because it's so much smaller than Hamburg. But everything is so close, which I, I think is great. So you can go everywhere by bike, actually by foot, and you can go to your university, to every supermarket, downtown, your friend's house. And I feel very safe in Lüneburg. I don't know, what about you guys? How did you experience moving from a big town to a a smaller district. Well, I'm just learning about how to ride a bike, sadly, <laughs> even though I'm 20, but like by foot, you can go everywhere. I'm telling it from the experience. Yeah. You have no problems at all, so. Yeah. yeah, I think having a bike in a small city, it's just awesome. You can reach just everywhere with your friend. And because normally in small cities, maybe after 10, the bus just stop working. Yeah. So yeah, but make sure you lock your bike. Definitely lock your bike and you have a great time. Yeah. And if you don't have a bike, you also always have the opportunity to go by train to a bigger city. Maybe if you need a little escape from Lüneburg and also discover all the smaller villages in between. I think this is a huge advantage. Yeah, mm. right. My bike just got stolen, actually. So oh Lüneburg is really <laughs> dangerous for that. Um, yeah, but I think that's like a common problem, right? You have the same problem. and and bigger towns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so in my experience, we, our dormitory, we have like a storage room for bikes. Yeah. So it's really safe for me. Although my previous bike was stolen because I didn't park <laughs> it in the right place. Yes. Yeah. yeah, definitely have to take care of that. But you can also use the train or take your bike on the train and then discover smaller places. As you said, I think smaller businesses is also a good point. Definitely, yeah. I feel like smaller businesses have it easier in smaller villages, smaller towns, because they have like usual supporters from the citizens. Does that make sense? <laughs> so the whole yeah. village kind of supports them when they go to the same bakery or the same cafe, the same restaurant every time. And you don't really have that in a big town, right? So people can just go to chains or they can change their current supermarket. Yeah. Definitely. And a lady from 1914, social media and free friends. Believe it or not, how these things connect to each other, you can find out on the train ride between Hamburg and Lüneburg. Let's have a look. Next stop, Vinsen. We've arrived in one of the bigger stops along our ride, a town that houses roughly 35,000 people. Here we found a hidden treasure. Café Hulda was opened in 2015 by three friends as a long-awaited dream. One of which is Ilona Oertzen, the current owner of the café. The concept was actually to make the café as regional and seasonal as possible and to serve the customers in a more sustainable way. And when we serve individual buffets for the tables, we make sure that the portions we serve aren't too large. Nicht zu viel auf den Tisch kommen. The name of the cafe is inspired by the woman who used to live in the building in 1914. Hulda herself ran a restaurant here but had a passion for baking and Mrs. Ertzen believes she would have liked what has been created inside her old home and that she watches over the cafe now. I've been working in bakeries and pastry shops as well as the cafe for over 40 years and I've always seen a lot of leftover food, for example a lot of bread, bread rolls, etc. at bakeries that are thrown away in the evening. I think that is terrible, which is why we chose to not do this in this way. We buy as little as possible and make good use of it and then process what's left over again. One of the bigger challenges in running the cafe as sustainable as possible is the unpredictability in number of customers. But even for this problem, Mrs. Erzen and her team have found a solution. Ab und zu 
Um, hatten wir das Café aus From time to time we had the cafe fully booked and suddenly 10 people cancelled here and four people cancelled there and we had already prepared everything. And then we decided we need Instagram, Facebook or something like that where you can offer it quickly, where you can post about it, where you can say, come over, we still have breakfast left that we have prepared. Come to Holda. Come to Holda. The individuality and sustainability of the small business are especially important to Mrs. Erzen and her team. Compromising their values in order to increase efficiency would not be an option for them. That would be system gastronomy, and that's something we don't want to be. We wanted the niche and to be special. The special dishes that people feel comfortable, that they can relax here and enjoy a little time out. We want for them to live happy with some sun in their hearts, so to speak. We are leaving Winsen full of cake and with sunshine in our hearts. Off to the next stop! Seems that more and more stores are promoting sustainability now. Um, however, I still see many bakeries in train station. They, um, they are not able to sell all the breads out until the midnight, so maybe they'll need to throw it away. But um, this reminds me something. So when I just came to Ludeburg, I, um, I bought some bread, and then uh, I went to the platform, and then suddenly, like, um, I couldn't find this platform, so I asked a, a police officer, and then he told me, oh, it's this platform. However, your train was cancelled. I was like, huh? How is a train cancelled in Germany? Yes, so I still went onto the train, which was obviously a wrong train, and I went to Bretman. Yes, so I stuck in Bretman for uh, a couple hours, and then I found, oh, maybe I should take a taxi to Ludenburg, and then I did it. And I didn't know it was so expensive to take a tax taxi here. So I spent like, I think, oh no, I went to Hamburg first somehow. And then from Hamburg, I spent 100 euros on this. Oh, wow. Yeah. wow. No. How did you actually find out that you were on the wrong train? Um, so my internet started work working because I, I applied for a roaming service afterwards. But uh, in the beginning, I didn't have the internet. Yeah. So, but I still got the train, so. <laughs> this is amazing. But did the bread make your trip a little more enjoyable? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> it's really, it was really nice to have some bread on train. And I really like German train, actually. Um, yeah, even though they were sometimes cancelled, but yeah. I like the vibe and the seat. Like, it's pretty cozy. Do you have, like, other train experiences in general? Like, talking about more unfortunate experiences, uh, there's a train in Turkey, Istanbul, which takes you from Europe side to the Asia side. And while they were constructing it, uh, like, it was going under the sea. So as a child, I thought that I would see the whole sea while I'm on the train, but when I first took it, I was really disappointed as a kid because <laughs> there was nothing but concrete there, but yeah, well, what you can do. This is definitely a thing. I yeah. think train experiences are so different all the time, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, if you're lucky, you can usually have a nice trip, maybe with some bake rolls or some bread, as you said. <laughs> I yeah. feel like there are so many negative train experiences where people were delayed or stranded like in a, another town. But uh, I once had um, a train ride and the people there were so nice because I was there's always the announcement ride. So welcome on the train from Hamburg to Lüneburg or so. And the guy was so nice. He was like, hello, uh, I'm Ludwig and I'm gonna take you to Lüneburg. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole the whole train was laughing, actually. Yeah. He was really nice. That was like a good vibe. Speaking of good vibes and German trains. <laughs> yeah, I think this is definitely important. You also feel safer and just nicer on your trip when you kind of have this personal interaction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really nice to hear like real person announcement. Like you, you normally don't hear it, I think, in most countries. And sometimes they, they just feel tired and you can hear the sound their voice is like, ah, oh, I want to get up to work. But sometimes <laughs> they're so energetic. They're saying, like, welcome to Hamburg. This is I mean, <laughs> such a nice place to explore or something. Yeah, just such. Well, in Turkey, it's almost impossible to have these uh, personal conversations in the train because getting on a train is a like much bigger thing in Turkey. Uh, wow. 
even to go to the train station, you need to go through the security pass, you need to like show wow. them your ID, then you have your boarding pass to your designated seat. And I think it happens in ICE as well, like yeah. at least your designated seat, but there is not how much process of at least security. And like, yeah, it's, it's almost like going into a plane. Yeah. yeah but like... And they're still on punctual. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but speaking of train, um, have you ever thought about like what if your train is on fire? Who should you go to? Fortunately, there are more than 22,000 fire services in Germany. There are all volunteers and they are willing to help you even in small towns. The Voluntary Fire Brigade in Radbruch exists since 1902 and currently has around 30 active members. Recruiting new ones is not always easy these days. Especially because a lot of young people move to the cities and the small village fire brigades are not interesting for them. An important source of new members are the junior and children sections of the organization. They join at a young age, learn over time, develop passion for the work, and some of them then join the regular fire brigade once they become adults. One of such cases is Frederike, who explains why she joined the junior section when she was a young child. For me, personally, it was through my family. A lot of people enter because fire brigade is like a second family. You can just be yourself, you will be taken to the community and integrated. And nobody needs to pretend to be someone else because everyone has the same quirk. Her friend Tamina explains the transition from the junior section to the regular fire brigade. If you want to go to an operation with the regular fire brigade, you need to do a basic training which is called Truppenanteil 1. Both of us did this one about like a week or two ago. Part of their work is also recruiting new members. Once a year, we visit the fourth graders with the junior section before they leave to primary school. And we show them our work so we can attract them before they go to whatever other schools. They hung up posters with the regular fire brigade advertise on social media and at public events. Solving challenges as a team brings them much closer, whether they need to extinguish a fire or recruit new members. It is not only the fire brigade itself. We are not just colleagues. Because the situations which we go through together makes us a second family. As they say, positivity is the key. I assume so because there will always be people with the helper syndrome who will want to join. If not here, then somewhere else. There will always be someone who will want to do this and will have to do this, unfortunately. It seems that the fire brigade in Radbruch will be around for at least as long as it has been around so far. Well, that is some great work that the fire services do there, but also so dangerous, right? So the other day, I felt actually really anxious on the train because uh, I came back from a holiday and I had to take the train from Hamburg to Lüneburg in the middle of the night and I thought I'd be the only one on the train so I was already making up plans on what to do <laughs> in order to be safe but uh, I entered the train at Hamburg Hauptbahnhof actually and there was a group it was so nice really it was a group of old people like maybe 10 grandmas and 10 grandpas or so and they were coming from I think the opera or the theatre in Hamburg or so, and they were laughing and cheering and um, they were actually leaving the train in Lüneburg as well. Uh, so I guess they were coming from Lüneburg to Hamburg in order to yeah, get some culture experiences. Um, what do you think about that? Would you, you do that if you were older? Would you go to the next big city by train? I think this is one of the biggest advantages, as you mentioned, like having this experience um, of different cities and also the possibility to maybe live in a smaller one, but go to a bigger one whenever you need to. 
it could be cultural experience as your granny's there with uh, some nice opera. But I also think um, just for work, it's also very simple. Many families and people just prefer to live in a smaller town. We already mentioned the kind of safety you feel uh, whenever you just know your bus driver or whoever. Um, so I think it's always very nice to live in a smaller town but be able to go to Hamburg, just take the train to work, for example, just because there are a few more job opportunities. Um, so yeah, definitely cultural aspects, working aspects that are helpful. Yeah. Um, I think, is it kind of like a cultural thing in Germany <laughs> that your trains are always delayed? <laughs> <laughs> like, one thing about delays, when you're stranded in, like, middle of nowhere in the train, so, like, when the train waits for the another one to pass, uh, what I would do is, like, if it's not nighttime, uh, I will just look around to see the hidden gems around the railway and I think it's one of a, like a fun activity to do because you usually don't have service as well. Do you guys have any experiences with, it, with hidden gems on our way? Oh, we actually did. Yeah, one time we were coming from Hamburg to uh, Lüneburg and we already had some delays I think and we were just sitting in the train and waiting for some announcements and then the train actually got started but it just stopped in, in Stelle and the announcement was actually, oh yeah, we were just gonna go back to Hamburg Hauptbahnhof and the whole train was uh, just really confused. So everybody had to go off in Stelle and we didn't know what to do. So we were just walking around, around Stelle and we were actually thinking of just knocking at some doors <laughs> in order to uh, <laughs> talk with someone, I don't know. But it was actually a cool experience because I do not think I would have gone to Stella by myself, you know, but in that case, I was actually able to see the city and yeah, in the end, a friend had to pick us up. <laughs> but <laughs> was this still is a the nice problem with the delays, right? Yeah. I think you told a very nice story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was in Stitch Stella as well, and I was so confused because, like in Taiwan, our trains just like are always pretty punct punctual uh, compared to Germany. Uh -huh. And yeah, but in Japan, is even much better. So. I don't know. Maybe it's um, maybe you have too much, too many trains in like such a narrow um, tracks. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, I don't really know. But uh, is are they really that punctual? Like, okay, I know Germany <laughs> is maybe not the best country to compare it to, but yeah, I would say. Um, so I'll just bring out some statistics. Mm -hmm. um, I think for trains, they are um, over ninety percent. Wow. Yeah, normally they're punctual, of 90%. Wow. Yeah, over 90%. And for MRT, Taipei MRT, Taipei Subway, um, it was like over 97% or something. There was even one year, like, there were zero trains were delayed. Ooh. So there, <laughs> there's such. <laughs> <laughs> I really yeah. hope the German future looks like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, talking about delays and finding hidden gems on our delays, mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of hidden gems to discover on our way. If you want to go back in time and see the arch nemesis of Don Quixote, this one's for you. Here in Badovic, the family of Eckhard Meyer has been keeping old craftsmanships alive in their windmill for over 200 years. This windmill is one of only five in northern Germany that are still used commercially, with 30 workers, five of them in mill production. I am Ekamaya. I'm the owner of this windmill, now in its sixth generation. At the turn of the century in 1900, there were still 15,000s. Because of its precious cultural value, the windmill was awarded the Intangible Culture Heritage in 2018. Intangible means it is not about the building itself, but rather the lift craft. So you have to be careful with me. I'm a protected species. This flower here is produced from raw materials of this region. The worker is filling multiple paper bags with spelled flour for the windmill shop. Each one weighs 25 kilograms. This has been happening since the beginning of the windmill in 1813.
This is actually a flour mill. Such wind and water mills were used for the production of various products, for sawing wood, for paper production, for paint production. But the flour mill is the most common variant, and we process grain into both animal feed and groceries. The produced flour and other products are sold in the shop directly in the windmill. Here they were grinding corn with the help of the old millstone to produce animal feed. Eckhart explains to us how there are some difficulties running this windmill. The old machinery doesn't always work perfectly. Somebody needs to be there all the time to ensure its safety and operation. But I like to do it and it is fun. I find the encouragement and the interest of people in this old technology is what excites me. Eckhart's passion and people's interest are perfectly shown at the Windmill Festival on Whitson, where around 5,000 people come to get a tour of the mill and take a closer look at its cultural heritage. Once a year, there's the German Windmill Day. Throughout Germany, around 1,000 historical windmills take part. The whole thing came into being in 1994 for the first time, and we have been part of it since the beginning. Maya's windmill has been one of few keeping old craftsmanships alive right here in Badovic. Our TV show is coming to the end. Um, I hope you had a great time. We hope we really introduce you some hidden treasures from Hamburg to Lüneburg. Thank you so, so much for watching, and I hope that we see you somewhere between Hamburg and Lüneburg. Bye bye. 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 <laughs>